Open your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 6. And I just want to re-emphasize this one thing, that we are to take the Bible literally, for it is at all possible. Take it literally, where it's all, if it's at all possible. If symbolic, figurative, or typical language is used, then we are to look for the literal truth it intends to convey. The revelation is an account of Jesus' campaign for the rulership of this earth. And that's what revelation is all about. Revelation chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 1. And there's a key verse I'd like to give you first of all, and that key verse is the 17th verse. Revelation 6, 17, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There's a great day of his wrath coming when Jesus Christ is going to come back to deal with people of this earth, and that's Revelation 6, verse 17. May I give you just a brief outline of what we're going to be discussing in this section? First of all, it has one point, this outline. It's entitled, The Six Seals Opened. And then underneath this one point, we have A through F. A, the spirit of Antichrist or worldwide conquest. B, the spirit of war. C, the spirit of famine. Four, plague of death. E, tribulation martyrs. And the F, a great earthquake, which closes out the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. Now we go to chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. We saw in chapter 5, if you'll remember the Lamb up in heaven around the throne, and he was the only one that was found worthy to open a book or to even take a book, a sealed book. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. That's in 5-7. Now when we come to 6-1, we find the Lamb opening one of the seals because this book which the Lamb had was sealed, and so he's opening the book. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, the voice of Almighty, a tremendous voice. The voice, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Originally, we made the statement that the book of Revelation is written in symbols, figures of speech, or typical language is used, and this first seal is spoken of as a white horse. This is not Jesus Christ in 6, 1, and 2. But it is Jesus Christ in Revelation 19, verse 11. Because in verse 11 of the 19th chapter, we see heaven opened, and we see Christ coming out of heaven, out of the realms of heaven, down to the earth, riding a white horse. But here, in chapter 6, 1 and 2, this is the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of conquest, the spirit of anti-God anti-Holy Spirit, anti-church, against anything that's right. We find that spirit prevailing even in the very first century when John was caught from the island of Patmos and eventually taken up to heaven, but on Patmos revealed all of these great crews. Even the spirit of anti-God prevailed in that day because John had been banished to the island of Patmos because of his stand for the word of God. And we see today throughout the whole realm of this world there is a spirit of antichrist. We've seen that Bibles have been taken out of our school system. We've seen that prayer has been taken out of our school system. I remember as a young lad in school, in the grade schools, it was a great thrilling time. The first 
half an hour of the morning session in our school when we all went in to the one room, three or four grades of us, and we sat down and a godly teacher got out the Bible and read a chapter from the Holy Word. And then we had prayer. And then we sang a hymn or two, even in grade school. And then we went to our lessons and we studied. And the teacher didn't have any trouble with a disciplinary problem because we were saturated with the Word of God. Today they burn the schoolhouses down. They go in and wreck all of the furniture. They take paint cans and spray all kinds of obscenities all over the walls, inside and out of the school building, the taxpayers' hard-earned money, dollars that bought the things. There is the spirit of Antichrist, anti-God, anti-Holy Spirit, the spirit of conquest that's prevailing in the world, and we see it in the first seal in chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. And then in verses 3 through 4, we have the second seal. And when he had opened the second seal, verse 3, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. Red, this horse, is indicative of war, bloodshed, red. This red horse did what? Verse 4. And power was given unto him, or given to him, that sat thereon, that sat on the red horse. It had a rider, a rider on the red horse. Power was given unto him to take peace from the earth. And peace has been taken from the earth. Not only since World War II, not only since World War I, but literally there is no peace in the earth today because constantly we are always building up our military budgets and building up our war implements, all of the countries of the earth constantly doing it, getting ready for war. And though we aren't actually pulling the triggers and shooting people, yet we are in a state of war and a state of emergency exists. Who ever heard of a hotline with our enemies, a red phone hotline? in the White House and with the major powers of this world. And this is all set up so that we can avert a war if at all possible. We live in a day and age of war. We're building up to it. And there has to come a time when that war preparation will be utilized and we're heading toward it just as fast as we possibly can. Verse 4, And power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And watch the last phrase of verse 4, And there was given unto him a great sword. The rider of the red horse, which is indicative of war, it was given to him a great sword. In 1945, the Manhattan Project was exploded, brought to realization, because it had been hidden and had been camouflaged from the American people for so many months as the Manhattan Project but it was actually the developing and the manufacturing and the perfecting of the atomic bomb. And on the white sands of the New Mexico desert in 1945, one morning at 5.30, that tremendous explosion took place, the first of its kind in the history of mankind, and it was though that the Light from a thousand suns burst upon the horizon early that morning and plunged man into a new era of time. And it was the further perfecting and developing and the instrumentation of that bomb that brought World War II to a grinding halt and put the Japanese enemy on their knees begging that we bring the war to a close. Mankind today has a great sword that he's never had before. 
I'm saying this carefully so you'll not misunderstand me. It is possible for one man to give a misdirected order or command that could literally annihilate every human being on planet Earth within a 24-hour span. We live under that shadow. We live under the mushroom cloud of possibility because of the red horse. And there was given unto him a great sword in verse 4. Let's move on to verses 5 through 6. And we take off the third seal according to verse 5. And I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. A black horse. And this is the third seal coming off. The third seal is known as a black horse. And this is indicative of famine. Now, may I clarify something before I proceed too much further? These have not just started in the last 25 years. These have not started in just the last 100 years, but these have been moving for hundreds of years, but we see them gaining in momentum. And we see the possibility of these things heading up into a tremendous crescendo of fulfillment and bringing this age to a climax which will literally be fulfilled when the line of the tribe of Judah... The Lamb of God comes back from the glory land at his second advent and comes down to this earth, according to Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. And then we see the great battle of Armageddon unfolded there in the area of Jerusalem as the soldiers of this world are gathered in the plains of Jezreel just north of Jerusalem to the east of the city of Haifa. The Middle East is to become the number one focal point of all military action in the last days. And you can see yourself, according to your morning newspapers, that the Middle East is prime target today for all considerations of governmental control and governmental inquiries. All of our statesmen head, first of all, to the Middle East. They don't go to Japan. South America, they're not worried about that. They go to the Middle East. Right there is where it started. Right there is where it's going to conclude one of these days. When the Bible says that the blood of the soldiers engaged in that last great conflict will literally run up to the bridles of the horses. You take the Bible literally where it is at all possible if symbolic, figurative, or typical language is used, then you look for the literal truth it intends to convey, and I don't see any other way to interpret it but that way. Don't spiritualize it. You'll lose it. You'll miss the whole content of the entire thing. The black horse, verse 5. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. pair of balances. Black horse, indicative of famine. Balances. These are scales. It's relative to food. And any time you find scales or balances in the Bible... In connection with food, it's always an indication of a scarcity of food. It is possible that God could allow, permit, a catastrophic situation to prevail across this great land of ours, 2,500 miles from ocean to ocean, that would literally cause all of us to become hungry. And it wouldn't take a long time for it to accomplish. God could wipe out the food in this country in a very short span of time. And when you start feeding 222 million people with no food, you've got a problem. You've got a real problem. And sometimes we get smug and self-satisfied and 
We got all of our push button conveniences wrapped around us. And we think we've got it by the tail. But I tell you, when God's time comes to judge and punish America, we're going to have a real difficult time. I believe that God is raising up fountainheads like this all across the nation just to get people conscious of the spiritual things that he has for us. Watch this sixth verse relative to the black horse. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts or creatures say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The olive and the grape need no cultivation. They seemingly grow wild. The olive and the grape. The olive tree just constantly bears the olives. The grape, year after year, you don't have to do anything but harvest the grapes in the fall, cut back the the vine in the in the uh, the dead part of the season and then in the spring here it comes back again you see but the command is that they hurt not the oil and the wine because their ruthless destruction is forbidden by nature itself in other words when this famine this black horse rides through the land through the planet earth even god instructs the forces of the element that you protect the olive and the grape because these are the natural. These are not the things that man cultivates. But basically, they come automatically from God. And God is preserving those particular things. But he's saying that this black horse is going to gallop across the stage of time. And when you look at that globe of the world there and you realize that on this planet Earth tonight, there are approximately 4 billion people. The United Nations Food and Health Order tells us that approximately one half of everybody on planet Earth tonight in a 24-hour span will go to bed hungry, gnawing pains in the stomach. And before this time, tomorrow evening, between 10 and 16,000 people will die because of no food. Now, what will it be like when the black horse is galloping across the stage of time, unchecked, unhindered, and he is allowed to go by the forces of nature to accomplish the deadly devastation That will be permitted him to do in that time. You can see why Jesus Christ took the book and then he began to take the seals off. And then the destructions were unleashed one by one upon mankind. We move into verses 7 through 8 and there we have another horse. And this horse is known as a pale horse. A pale horse. There's arguments that it's light green, and one uh, commentator says it's dappled and this and that, but I'm going to stay by King James. He says a pale horse, and it really doesn't matter the color. That's immaterial. But look what happens with this pale horse. But you'll have to remember, at the same time the pale horse is galloping, also the white horse, worldwide conquest, the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of war, the spirit of famine, or the conquest of famine. And then the pale horse proceeds to gallop across the stage of time, looking at verses verses 7 through 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. He's showing John these different things. John is up in heaven. He's looking down to the earth in the sixth chapter over there. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them. Power was given to death and hell. 
over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Power is going to be given to the rider of the fourth horse, which is the pale horse. The rider is death, and hell is following after him, scooping, as it were, the bodies of those who have died. Because if you stop and think for just a moment, when the forces of this horse and that one and that one are actually activated, and this one comes along with the power to kill the fourth of the people of the earth, you can see the tremendous amount of dead corpse lying all over planet Earth. We never think of these things. A lady said the other day when she was invited to attend some of these sessions concerning the book of Revelation, she says, it's too awful, I couldn't stand it. But my friends, it isn't awful when you realize that God has promised his born-again believer his body in Christ, members of the believer's fellowship, the body of Jesus Christ, God has promised us to keep us from that hour. These are serious days. These first four seals, the spirit of Antichrist or world conquest, the red horse indicative of war, universal war, the black horse, which is famine, and we have read nothing in our newspapers for the last 20 years but famine all over the world. Russia's been plagued with it. Europe has been plagued with it. South America plagued with it. Famine. Pale horse. Death. Wait till they drop a few atomic bombs on a few of the countries. You don't think it'll ever happen? It's very possible, my friends, it will happen. These are serious days. I contend the devil is not going to manufacture all of these war implements and never use them. I want to be found standing on the soapbox somewhere telling people to get sheltered in the Son of God that will protect them from all of these physical things that are come upon the world in these last days. This fifth seal is a little bit different. The fifth seal deals with a period of time that we will come into a closer relation with in the not-too-distant future, but it's known as the tribulation period also identified as the 70th week of Daniel. It's a period known as seven years in length. And during this period of time here, the Bible tells us the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan are going to be running rampant upon the earth during the last half of that. And those three, the satanic trinity, during the last half, of that 70th week of Daniel, are going to be running supreme upon the earth unchecked, completely unchecked in whatever they want to do, unchecked. And the Bible says there will be some people saved during that period of time. And we'll elaborate on this in our next session when we study the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. But those people who are saved in that particular period of time, according to the scripture, are to be martyred. They're to die because of their testimony for Jesus Christ. That's what the fifth seal is all about. We stop now. We change from horses, a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, a pale horse. So we leave the four horses and we move into the fifth seal, which is not a horse, but it's a condition of martyrdom. Verse 9, listen to it. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar... That's this altar right here, up in heaven, the great white throne, the white throne. He saw underneath the altar, up in heaven, and you know there are three heavens in case you're not familiar with it. There's the first heaven where the clouds and the darkness are located. The second heaven where the sun, moon, and stars were placed in orbit. 
on the fourth day of recreation. And then the third heaven, the one that God is located, that's where the white throne is, right there. So in this particular verse that we're reading now about the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the white throne, the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. The way you're saved today, right there in the seat, you just say, well, I'm a sinner, I'm lost. I've made a fool of myself. I've wasted my life. I'm not living for God. I want to be a Christian. I want to believe the Word of God. I want to receive Christ. And by faith, you receive Christ. It's that simple. It's that simple. But it won't be that simple over here. Oh, no. Big difference. Listen. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice. Now, you'll get no soul sleeping here. There's no soul sleeping in the Bible. And this old malarkey, you know, when you die, you're just like a dog or a cat or a squirrel that got ran over in the highway. There's nothing to that. That's that long stuff you buy in the meat market that used to cost 29 cents a pound. Now it's $2.95 a pound. And you slice it thin to make it go around, and it's called baloney. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Thank God for a testimony. Thank God for people who have something to shout about. Thank God for people who know what they believe and they're not afraid to tell their friends that they believe it. That's why we're running advertisements in four cities in the newspapers and over television and over radio and we're putting signs all around this place because we're proud of what we believe. And we have a testimony. And they had a testimony in the fifth seal. And for the testimony which they held, verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice. They cried with a loud voice saying, question mark, how long, O Lord, holy and true? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? How long, Lord, is is this thing going to go on? They're up here in the third heaven where God is, underneath the altar, before the throne of God. That's where the second paradise is located. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. And they're looking down to this, down to the earth from the third heaven, and they're seeing all of this chaos that's going on on the earth during the tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel. The church is not there at that time. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them. There'd be no point in talking to them if they were asleep. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. They should rest. I'm looking forward to going to paradise. I'm going to rest. I'm tired, but I'm not letting myself know I'm tired because I just pump myself up with enthusiasm every morning and I just pull right out of the garage all charged, ready to go. Though I am tired, I don't let myself realize I'm tired, but I know I'll rest up there because it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants... Also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Meaning to say, there's going to be in the fifth seal a tremendous slaughter. And that fifth seal must literally come within the confines of this seven-year period 
of the 70th week of Daniel because it's during that period that there's going to be the tremendous slaughter on the earth and they will be people who lived on the earth in the church age. They were not born again. They might have been members of a church but not truly born again. And so when Jesus Christ came at the rapture of the church and he took the church out, he only took those who were literally born of the Spirit of God. The professors were left behind. And the possessors went up in the glory land. And they were not possessors, they were professors. And they went into the tribulation period. And then when they got into the tribulation period, they remembered having been in World Prophetic Ministry Auditorium. They were taught the Word of God. They were instructed. They saw the 12-foot chalkboard. They heard the illustrated sermons time and time again. They turned down the opportunity to be saved. But once the rapture took place, then all of that teaching came back vividly to them, and they preferred to die a martyr's death and be saved as a martyr rather than to go on into hell eternally and suffer the consequences of eternal damnation with the wicked throughout the countless ages of God's eternities. And that is not a second chance. People come running up usually after an exposition like this and they say, oh, you teach a second chance. Well, what if I taught a third chance or a fourth or a fifty? God gave me a hundred chances. Look at all the chances that you and I have had. You weren't saved the first time you ever heard the gospel. You, you, you weren't. You couldn't have been. We're too proud in America to be saved the first time we ever hear the gospel. We have too much luxuries. We have too much will. We're bent in the opposite direction from God. The Bible says we go a-whoring after our own inventions. And every man is turned to his own ways. It's difficult. But you can go to some of the lesser economized countries where they don't have the things that we do, and you can reach them with the gospel much quicker than you can the, in America. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And that closes the fifth seal. Look at this twelfth through 17th verse, which is the sixth seal of the book of Revelation. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. You think that uh, this rumor that there is going to be a collision of the planet is shaking up a lot of people. You wait till this happens. I'll tell you, they'll be shook up when the stars start falling, when the sun becomes black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. We used to live down in West Virginia. My mother is here tonight, and she may remember this. We lived in a little town called Oxley, O-X-L-E-Y, in West Virginia, and had an eclipse of the of the of the uh, sun got dark in the middle of the day, and they turned the street lights on, and chickens all went to roost, and mother took us out in the front yard and began praying. You remember that? Yeah. We all thought the end of the world was coming. These people will think the same thing. Verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And the heaven, you see, the clouds in the darkness. You see, around this earth, you have a blanket of darkness. That's where the clouds in the darkness are located around the earth. And then on around that, you have the sun and the moon and the stars. And then around that, you have the heaven where God is located. But in this sixth seal, you see, God is going to cause this darkness 
just to be removed from around the earth. And then the people on the earth will be able to look right up into heaven and they'll be able to see the white throne up in heaven. They'll be able to see the things that John saw in chapters 4 and 5 and some of the things that we're going to see in chapter 7. During the sixth seal, the heavens departed as a scroll, a tremendous noise. And the unsaved people will look up into heaven and the things they'll see, my friends, will make the six o'clock news at night very tame what they are now. Very tame. In fact, I doubt if the anchor man will be able to anchor it in those days. It's going to be terrific, the things that are going to happen. Verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Because sinful man will see godly angels and he'll see the elements of God way up in the heavens. He'll be able to look up there and sinful man knows he's sinful. And he'll hide himself in the rocks and in the caves and under the bridges, the culverts and so forth. And he'll hide himself. And verse 16 says, he will cry for the mountains and rocks to fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? All of that is coming upon an unbelieving world. Chapter 7 is a parenthesis, and we don't get the seventh seal till we come to the beginning of the seventh seal. Is it the beginning? Yes, it's the beginning of the eighth chapter. We get the seventh seal. The seventh chapter is a complete uh, disconnected uh, teaching, explanation from the sixth chapter. And then when you come to the to the eighth chapter, verse one, it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. After all of this takes place, and this tremendous assault of the atmosphere that happens up in the heavens, and all of that, then the the last, the seventh seal is a period of silence. And there's nothing so devastating as nobody not saying anything. And that's what the seventh seal is all about. Next week, chapter 7. And you're going to have a revelation next week because chapter 7 deals with some things which you have been taught over the years, which I believe, and we'll go through it carefully, which I believe is an impossibility. And you'll see why in detail next week that I choose to be different because I believe that there is an era being taught in Scripture today and I believe that someone needs to step out in the forefront and declare the era and stay by the Word of God. What does the Bible say today? And if we can find it in the Bible without turning it around or cutting it off or twisting it or pulling it. And if we can just lay it down and it beautifully dovetails together and it's all in chronological order, then I say let's believe it. Thank you, Dr. Restep. We have come to the close of another chapter of the book of Revelation. I suggest you turn the tape over or go to the next tape in this series for the continuation of our study of the book of Revelation. Thank you.